In this video, I share 20 lessons that I learned in my first year of medical school and how they can hopefully add value to your 2020. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm Sebastian, a medical student studying in Australia. And today we're back to the sitting down, talking type of videos. It's the first one that I'm doing of 2020, so I'm really excited. And I know it's already three weeks into 2020, but I just got the hang of writing 20 instead of 19 when I date things. So I think it's officially here. And uni's about to start for me, and I'm sure many others are in that period of uni's just coming around the corner. So I thought I'd share some of the lessons that I learned from my first year of medical school. Uh, some of them are cliche, some of them are obvious, but hopefully some of them can actually add value to your 2020 and some of the principles may cross over to things that you do. But with all that out of the way, let's get on to the first lesson. Start now. It's such a simple concept, the idea of starting. Uh, that could be anything. That could be starting a project, that could be starting studying, uh, that could be just getting out and doing a hobby that you've been wanting to do for a while. It's one of probably the scariest things, the idea of just starting something. Like this YouTube channel, for example, um, I sort of thought about it for a bit, thought it'd be interesting, but never actually considered making it a thing. And one day I'm just like, you know what? It's okay. I'm just going to start it. I'm going to see what happens. And it's a lot of fun and I enjoy it. And that, that concept doesn't just apply to hobbies. It applies to just studying itself. I found that when you're really in a muck and you don't want to do anything, just start doing something little. Within 10 minutes, you'll want to learn more. And then there'll be a question that you want to answer and you'll research and you'll keep going. So just by starting, that little five minutes that you plan on doing originally has now become 30 minutes, has now become an hour, and you've actually learned something. And along the way, you'll just get things done, and it's a really good feeling. Focus your procrastination. So that sounds a little bit confusing, but let me explain it to you. So when you're procrastinating, how I like to think of it is that there's a bunch of things on your list, a bunch of things that you should be doing. So say the most important thing is to be finishing that assignment that's due next week. So that's top of your list on what I have to do, but you really don't want to do it. Um, it's a little bit boring reading all these research papers and it's sort of hard to get over that sort of slump. Um, sometimes having a break is perfectly fine, but if you want to focus that procrastination, you, you could be doing something that's still productive, that's still contributing to something or project that you're working on. At the same time, it's still relaxing and it's still enjoyable. So for me, that might be editing this video. I edit this video instead of cracking down with study or it might be going for a run or doing some exercise. It's a very simple thing, and that way you'll be sort of energized, ready to go when you come back to doing that report or doing that assignment. Don't try to be interesting, be interested. So I know for me, going to a new cohort was super overwhelming. There's all these different people, and there's always that sort of tug at you that you need to go make new friends, that you need to really impress them, you need to be interesting, you need to show off for your, your talents or your skills. but Really, it's, it's not so much about that. People won't respond to you showing off or bragging. People respond to you being interested in them. And at the same time, by showing interest in that other person, they'll show interest in you. And that's how a lot of friendships are formed. We just gotta overcome that urge of trying to say all the things that we do and just let the conversation flow, listen, and just see what everybody has to say. Please do not wear your stethoscope outside of the hospital, in the cafeteria, or in the library. Just don't be that guy. All right, next lesson. When life gets busy, don't forget about your family and loved ones. So for me, this is something that I really picked up um, last year. When starting med school, uh, you find there's an overwhelming amount of content and you really want to keep up and you really want to sort of maintain that perfectionist level of thinking that I need to know this concept, that concept, uh, this bit of theory, I need to finish that assignment. And there's a lot on your plate. And by doing that, you sort of forget about the ones close to you, you don't make as much time. But I think it's important to just slow down and remember that the ones that were supporting you to get into med school or the ones that are supporting you on this journey, that they were the people that sort of got you there in the first place. So it's important to spend a lot of time with them, uh, especially during these busy periods, and that it's okay to just slow down once every while. The result isn't important, the process is. So if there's anything that you'll take away from this video, I think it's this one. The result isn't the big thing, it's the process, it's the study habits that you formed, it's the friendships that you made, it's the behaviors that you changed or the things that you've learned, how you've grown and how you've just got better at what you do. That's the most important thing. It's the process and the journey. I know this is cliche. It's all the skills that you've acquired along the way. Consistency triumphs in the long run. So this is something that I really battled with throughout the year. 
you sort of get hot and cold, you're up and down, so you've got an assignment, or you've got a test coming up, and you'll go really, really hard with the study for a week or so, and then you'll slow it down, holidays will come around, and you won't do really much. But I found that really towards the end of it, it was all about consistency. I'd rather be doing one hour every day than four hours twice a week, because this one hour of habit of getting to the routine of doing this will lead itself to two hours and you'll just get used to it. It'll become sort of part of your lifestyle. And this autopilot is what we have to sort of aim for. And on this note, I was introduced to a new program, which I'm sure many of you are already aware of, but it's called Anki. And it's this flashcard system, which uses this space repetition system. So if you haven't already checked it out, I definitely consider looking into Anki as a learning tool. So by incorporating these steps into your daily life, they don't become a chore or something that you have to sit down and actively do. This consistency will just lend itself to just being coming a habit, uh, something that's on autopilot. And you won't even know that you're doing all this work. And that's really what you want to sort of get towards. Create a distraction-free study space. So what you're seeing behind me is just my desk set up with these screens that I'm using. And I find that it's really good because for me, I was, I was very into video games when I was younger and that would be a huge distraction when I was trying to do anything sort of productive. And as such, I don't have any games on this computer. This is just where I, this is my workstation. This is where I get my workflow done. Whether that be at home, if you have a desk set up or going to a library or going to a cafe that you really like, by just making sure that what you do there is solely focused uh, you'll get a lot more done and you'll have a lot more time to have all those distractions to catch up with those friends afterwards. So by just creating this zone, I think it'll save you a lot of, a lot of time um, in the long run. So make a solid group of friends in medical school, but also make sure that you have a good group and a good friendship circle outside of medical school. So what I mean by this is that when you're in medical school, you're going to meet so many talented new people and you'll definitely go on to make some lifelong friendships. And it's super important because not only will these friends be someone to talk to and someone to hang out with, but it's also important to form good study circles, to form good routines, to have accountability partners when you're slacking off during semester. But you also have to remember that medical school is just something that you go to, but it's not everything. And I think it's very important to make sure that because you're gonna be spending so much time studying medical related concepts, studying medicine, it's gonna sort of um, be very involved with your life. It's important to have hobbies, to have people outside of that realm um, to chat to, to bounce ideas off of. They're gonna think very differently. They're gonna offer so many countless new experiences and perspectives. And so I think it's really useful to have a solid group um, within and also outside of medical school and your university. Spontaneity is fun. I know that some of the best memories that I had last year were just ones that um, you decided on a whim. The meetups after class or doing stuff with your friends when you sort of weren't planning to. They just become the most memorable experiences. And I think when you look back on the short time at university or the short time in medical school, what really stuck out is all the little things that you just did on a whim that were spontaneous, that were really fun, that were really memorable. And they're the things that you're gonna look back on. The 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle is a really good principle. I was first introduced to this principle by Tim Ferriss in his book, The 4-Hour Workweek. And what the principle states is that 80% of the effects comes from 20% of the causes. I'm not saying this is black and white, but just generally 80% of the things you'll be tested, for example, in an exam will come from 20% of the foundational theory that will sort of structure everything else. 80% of the things that you'll be using in the clinic will come from 20% of the foundational knowledge. That's just bedside manner, how to take a structured history, how to perform a structured exam. So by getting out of this mindset that you need to know 100%, but really it's just the 20% of the things that you're doing every day that's giving you 80% of the reward or the effects. That's really the things you have to focus on and that's the things that you have to utilize. Find out when you're most productive and use that time. So following on this trend of productivity, it's important to know when you're actually awake, when you focus and when you're wanting to be productive. Because I know for me, maybe for you guys as well, that you hit that afternoon time and it's just two hours where you just want to do nothing. Like you can't, you want to have a nap or you want to watch TV. So for me, that's generally in the afternoon. And what I found out is that I was really productive sort of mid to late morning and sort of in the evening after dinner. And so what I try to do is I'd spend that two hours or three hours where I was really focused just to make sure that I'm doing productive things, working on videos or studying or um, trying to learn a new topic or whatever that is. And that when I just don't function, that's just the sort of the mid afternoon when it's sort of the sun sort of setting. I just like to relax and enjoy my free time or go grab some coffee with a friend. So it's really important to find out when you're productive 
and to utilize that time. Cardiovascular physiology and respiratory physiology is hard and I want to be focused when I'm trying to learn that. Wake up early. Yeah, I said it. I'm not a morning person, but waking up early, although I'm not doing it now on holidays, just a disclaimer, but I will be doing it when I get back into uni. Waking up early is one of the best things for your routine, for your day. Last year, I read this book called Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod, if I said that right. And he talks extensively about the importance of getting out of bed, forming sort of like a morning ritual, so to say, where you're doing things that sort of will add value later on the day. So whether that be exercise, whether that be meditation or journaling, reading, um, by doing all these different things, it's sort of you getting you in a mindset to look forward to waking up, to look forward to taking on a new day. And as humans, we react to light cycles. So really when the sun comes up at six, so should we. And I found that when I was applying that sort of waking up principle later into my semester, I found that I was just being more productive and I was feeling more energized when it came throughout the day. And yes, it means you have to sleep early, but the reward is definitely worth it. No one ever criticized someone for trying their best. So let me give you an example. Uh, last year, especially when I was very new to clinical um, tutorials or to bedside teachings when you're in the hospital, whenever my tutor would come around and ask us, who wants to take uh, the history? Who wants to perform the exam? Um, a lot of us were quiet, especially me. Um, I sort of never put my hand up at the start because um, it was scary. It was something that I'd never sort of done before. But as I went through the year, you realized that Really, whatever you do, as long as you're trying your best, you're putting in effort, you've done the research, even if you look a bit silly or it's not perfect, no one's ever gonna criticize you, all you're gonna get is respect and appreciation. And you're gonna learn way more than just hanging back and watching. Increase your heart rate every day. Uh, so this one's probably just common sense or a throwaway one, but for me, especially when I was just sitting down at my desk, uh, pretty much the whole day studying, or trying to prepare for an exam. I'm a little couch potato by my desk. So I found that getting up, um, it doesn't have to be completely active, like going for a run or going to the gym, but just moving around, getting your heart rate up, that's what humans are designed to do, to get up, to move around. We came from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So just reminding yourself that, especially on lazy days or work days, when you're just sitting down, you're very sedentary, to get that heart rate up, to get that pulse up, you release some endorphins, you'll feel pretty good, and you'll come back into it feeling a bit more energized. So following along from the lesson about trying your best, it's important to do something that scares you every day. So I'm not saying do something that physically scares you like shoplifting, because that's pretty exhilarating, that would scare you. But I'm just talking about little things like, I know for me when I'm browsing in a, in a retail store, even though I have a question on hand, I'll do everything to research it or to try to figure it out in the store instead of just asking the person because it's like, oh, I don't want to bother them, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be a pain. So Matt Diavella recently did a video that I watched, I'll put the link down below, where he talks about the concept of flow and how flow is essentially the state of focus or mental clarity where we're just, we're just being able to think clearer and to work more efficiently than we normally do. So some of the triggers to reach the state of flow can be novelty, can be risk, can be complexity, I'll put the five of them here. But just thinking about that, by putting yourself in a risky, risky situation, putting yourself in a new complex environment or a new topic, doing something that sort of scares you, that's gonna force you to be more focused, to think more clearly, to learn more efficiently, to learn quickly. So the analogy I use for learning is one where you're sort of on like a tightrope and on one side is a flat surface where you can cushion where you can fall and the other side is the massive drop underneath and you sort of teeter between both sides and that's what really good learning should be. You should have the side that's going to support you as your concrete foundational knowledge, the things that you know already, the things that you're comfortable with. And then the big drop is the new concepts that you're learning, the things that you don't understand, the things that you find too hard, too difficult, and you just give up on. Because if you keep revising old content that you're good at, you're not going to learn. But if you, if you put yourself from knowing nothing about cardiovascular physiology to putting yourself in the most complex theories about it, you're not going to learn anything. So it's that slow accumulation of gathering more foundational knowledge and then building upon what's new. It's character building, it's confidence building. You'll grow and you'll learn a lot about yourself along the way. <laughs> Write down the milestones to remember where you started. I explicitly remember going through the anatomy spot test with my friend and we were going through these different identifications and then just rounding them off. Oh, that's the internal jugular vein on the radiograph. Oh, that's 
um, the musculocutaneous nerve piercing through coracobrachialis. And we were just looking at each other and being like, wow, um, we didn't really know much anatomy before we came into this, but now we're actually getting this. It's sort of making sense. So it's easy to fall into this trap that you compare students that are older than you or compare yourself to a doctor or to, to someone that's just more experienced and to be like, I'm inadequate, I don't really know much. But if you write down the milestones and look back to how much you've improved from knowing not that much to knowing a lot, it'll really put things into perspective and it'll sort of like, it'll be like a time warp of like looking back in the past and be like, wow, I was so dumb back then. And I think it's a really nice feeling and it's really satisfying to look back on these sort of achievements. Scope out your course and pre-read before coming to lectures. So this is just super obvious for all us university students, but I'd say like most of us don't do this and I certainly didn't do it. But you go into a, a lecture or you start your course and you really have no idea what's going on and you sort of backtrack and try to catch up as you go along the semester. But I found that once I got used to it and once I got into better routine, just by pre-reading, just by actually doing your homework, um, doing the pre-reading tutorials and the related um, videos or whatever it is they've given you, and then you're coming in more prepared, you'll just learn more efficiently on the day. So it's easy to catch up. Some people will just catch up naturally. But for me, just having this extra bit of knowledge um, just made that learning step so much quicker, so much more efficient. You are able to utilize your class time and that made doing um, post-class work just way more easy. And on that note, another thing that you can be doing is to start creating knowledge trees. So once you've started scoping out your course, you understand how the semester is structured or what the topics are, you just can start branching out um, from topic to topic. So I know that for me, my medical school structured it. Um, so for example, cardiovascular block was structured into say, um, vascular diseases and then valvular heart diseases and cardiomyopathies, congenital heart diseases. They, they branch in that topic. So those can all be topic headings. And then under that, you'll have specific pathologies and under that, you'll have more pathologies. But by being able to categorize information to create these knowledge trees and to structure it, and by also scoping out your course in advance to know what you're expecting to see, that's really gonna help you fill in the blanks. And instead of learning things as separate pieces, they can all come together and just make sense. And that'll really just make your life a lot easier when it comes to try explaining it to your to your brother or to your dad about what you're learning because I've definitely been asked a lot of questions and I'm not really good at answering some of them so don't overthink things so I am probably like the king overthinker with everything that I do when I'm writing an email when I'm doing a report when I'm having a conversation with somebody, I'll hyperanalyze it in my head after, how'd that conversation go? What did I say to John? It's crazy, it just takes up so much of your time, so much of your thinking, and it all, it, all of it's pretty much useless. So once I sat back one day and realized that everybody's sort of dealing with their own problems and their own issues, and they have their own concerns in their life, and no one's gonna really notice the problems as much as you think they do. When that sort of just struck me, it's like, well, okay, I can go out and do things. And that sort of leads back to the very, very first lesson that I said about starting now that don't overthink it, don't let people's judgments or potential criticisms stop you from doing things. People have their own problems that they're dealing with, they're not gonna be worried about yours. Um, they'll just respect whatever you're doing and as long as you're trying your best, no one's gonna stop you. And finally, for the last one, plan to fail. You heard that right, plan to fail. By failing, you're gonna learn so much more and so much quicker than by reaching your goals slowly. Failing, you learn, okay, I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna try something. Um, failing means that you're gonna love the process because the process is a bunch of fails along the way. By failing, you'll just get better. A toddler learns how to walk by falling over a few times and then getting up. And I know that there's a perfectionist side to every one of us medical students, but just plan to fail, you won't worry about it, and you will get better. All right, so that's it for all the lessons that I've learned from first year medical school and from 2019 in general. Um, I hope you found some of them valuable, some of them useful, interesting, silly. If you had any more lessons of your own, please comment down below. I'd love to hear all the great things that you guys have learned in 2019 and then all the things that you'll apply in this new year, this new decade. If you guys are going back to uni, I wish you the best of luck. Uni is a great time, make new friends, do cool things. Don't stay at home like I do sometimes. Get out there. Um, it's a lot of fun and you'll learn lots if you just be proactive and make the most of it. If you liked the video, found the lessons useful, please chuck us a like, that really helps. Subscribe if you want to see more content like this. I'll be doing plenty more medical school videos soon, some study with me, um, some other productivity hacks and tips. So definitely stay tuned, a lot is to come. Anyways, thanks so much for watching and until next time, this is Sebastian, stay sharp. 
so this is my penguin. His name's Peter. He looks a bit funny, but he's still pretty cute. He's pretty cute. Far out, it is hot. If you don't already, Australia's hot. Feels like 39 degrees. I'm glad I'm inside. <laughs>